first of all, thank you so much to Point Blank for inviting me to speak here today. And thanks everyone for, for coming along. Hopefully you'll, you'll find this um, a kind of interesting introduction into spatial audio and its use in uh, live events. So yeah, so my name is Helena Rice. I'm an electronic music producer and AV artist. My, the kind of music I do ranges from quite abstract um, sort of soundscapes through to more beat driven stuff that's in the kind of genre loosely of IDM. So I'm inspired by producers like John Hopkins, Max Cooper uh, and rival consoles. I came to Point Blank uh, so I was a student here about 10 years ago. So I actually studied the diploma in music production and sound engineering when actually Point Blank was still based at the other campus. Um, so it's been a really interesting, interesting journey uh, in the uh, in, interim time. So I would say of myself that over that time, I've developed into what we call an immersive first producer. By immersive first, I suppose what I mean is my object when I create an event, to hear a live event, is how I can make the audience feel kind of enveloped in that event. So my object is really to move people outside of their day-to-day -day and make them feel really kind of involved and immersed in an event. And the tools that I use to do that, and this is a shot from uh, a show I did a couple of years ago at Earth Hackney, which is not far from here. The tools I use, uh, you can kind of see our visuals. So I'm not actually a visual designer myself. I work with a team, an international team of visual designers and technologists. I use some lights, so I, I can pro, uh, rudimentarily program lights and run that out of my Ableton set. And then obviously there's the audio side, so electronic music as mentioned. But often wherever I can, I'll do that in spatial audio. So spatial audio is basically, it's sort of the use of multi-speakers, uh, which can be surrounding the audience, it can also be above the audience. Um, and basically what you're doing is using specialized software to determine uh, where in space um, particular parts of your track are coming from. So you can split your track into what's called multiple sound objects. And then through the software and pre-programming, I can define exactly where, where those sounds are going to be in the auditorium. And for me, that's been, um, that's been an interesting dimension in order to achieve my object of moving people into sort of a different realm when, when they're uh, having this uh, experience. So effectively, if I was to look at Earth Hackney through the eyes of the software, this is kind of uh, what, uh, what it looks like. If we just go back to this picture again, you can just about see on this picture, what you've actually got is five quite powerful stacks along the front of the stage there. You've got, um, you can just about see, there's four actual speakers um, to each side of the audience. There's four speakers at the back of the audience. And then again, you can just about see there's some um, eight overheads. So it's a 17.1.8 uh, 17 system that I'm playing with effectively. M most people and most acts that are gonna come to Earth may not have programmed it. So you can redeploy a system like that just for stereo. But it's really exciting if you can have the time and the opportunity, if you have the opportunity to use a spatial system to program it for, for spatial sound. So as mentioned, that's sort of how it's seen through the, through the eyes of the software when we're looking at the speaker layout. So this uh, person here is effectively the audience. Those are those five quite powerful stacks at the front, um, the, the four speakers to the sides and the back, and the eight, the eight overheads here. So we'll take a little look at the software in some more detail just further along. In the first instance, I was just going to move um, backwards to talk about how I got into spatial um, sound, why that was relevant for my practice and why it might be relevant for your practice, and also to look at some use cases because there are lots of different reasons why immersive sound and immersive events are becoming more and more popular um, at, at the moment. And then also some, summarize at the end with some opportunities uh, and challenges as, as I see them uh, going forward. I, on one hand, am really inspired by electronic music producers uh, who use uh, visuals in, in their work to sort of complement the, the audio side. So this is Rival Consoles at a show he did at Clapham Grand a few years ago. Here he's actually programming using, I think, a Max for Live uh, patch, which is producing these incredible audio reactive patterns that are happening behind him. So on one hand, I sort of, I really like the idea that you could match sensors up within uh, an event. On the other hand, I'm inspired by things like installation artists. They're producing maybe more on the visual side, but they're using sound as a complement. So this installation is by a guy called Ryoji Ikeda, who has exhibited several times in the UK, but exhibits all around the world. 
Um, for this uh, exhibition, which was uh, at 180 The Strand, you, you took your shoes off and you actually walked into this installation. And there were basically some really powerful projectors above you that were projecting some kind of barcodes onto the floor. And then there were speakers set all around the, the audience. The trick is, is that the sound seemed to correspond with the movement of the barcode. So you start hallucinating that the two were somehow actually linked, whereas in fact, obviously, you've just got an audio track and you've got um, separately a visual track. But the way people carried themselves when they came into this space was incredibly different than their day to day lives. They suddenly sort of started sort of being astounded. It was quite a sort of wonderful kind of um, uh, experience. And this is an, um, an example from another group of artists called United Visual Artists. And they also actually have a current exhibition on, if you have a chance to see it, called Synchronicity, uh, which is also at 180 The Strand. They tend to use um, dark rooms as a blank canvas, and then light is, uh, and sometimes often laser lights and maybe layers of mesh in order to paint uh, quite graphic and um, pictures, but they also work with electronic sound artists. So you often, again, have this illusion of the sound and the light um, all, all moving together. So these were all kind of the different uh, elements that uh, inspired me. After I graduated in 2015, I'd started off learning in Logic and I actually swapped over to Ableton because I found for myself triggering uh, my live sets through Session View was actually more kind of appropriate for the way that, that I was working. Ableton became the core, the core of my setup. And I started playing just actually on sort of free networks around London. So one was called Crux AV, uh, which is a meetup for um, producers and a AV and vi visual artists. And it's actually still going on. It's run by one of the ex-tutors from um, Point Blank, a guy called Nick Feldman. And they do events over in New River Studios, which is up in Tottenham. I think they've got one coming up quite soon. So through that, I, I'm connected with a few people. And one of them was a VJ, VJ Mowgli, and he built me uh, these visuals which were produced in Max for Live, so a little like the ones that we saw uh, with rival consoles, and they were audio reactive. Um, they were sitting within my Ableton set, and my Ableton set, sorry, my Ableton set was communicating with uh, a software called Resolum, which is a very well-known VJ software, and I had some uh, basically OSC triggered activity. Um, so OSC is a type of code that will send a message from your Ableton set into another software. So you can sort of train it, say, okay, at this point, uh, this is when this track changes. So that means you need to change in Resolume to the next set of graphics. It can also, for instance, send frequency information. So uh, it was audio reactive to, to uh, the, the kick drum. So this was like a very, very embryonic start of trying to, to move uh, the electronic side into um, a sort of extended practice and look at other extensions of, of sensors. Um, flipping forward a few years, um, I'd started working with other visual designers. So this is a guy called Jan Petirik. Uh, who's standing next to me here. He was at the Royal School of Art doing information design. So we started working together and he was working on a software called Blender, but also works in and uh, started working with him in, in, in a, a gaming software called Unity. And we had an amazing opportunity to uh, play at Abbey Road Studios for a hackathon event. So it was, um, it, 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 you know, it was um, sort of like a have a go tech show, as it were. A lot of people in the audience were actually just programming apps at speed because they were all making music based applications using various technologies and they had a couple of artists on and we, we were one of them but um, the most interesting thing for me that day was that I met with L Acoustics so L Acoustics in, in case you don't know if you've ever been to a big arena gig you've probably either heard an L Acoustics system or a D&B system so they're, they're massive hardware suppliers who sort of dominate the arena industry however both of those and as do other firms also have subdivisions which specialize in spatial audio and immersive sound and L Acoustics is a slightly lesser known one so when people talk about spatial audio, everyone talks about um, Dolby Atmos almost because that, that dominates in the recording side. But if we look at live, actually, L Acoustics probably, um, well, L Acoustics and DB both have um, quite powerful immersive softwares, which are very similar to the Atmos software um, and which are maybe more suitable to work in line with their live um, speaker setups. So before I, started, I went to this event, um, I had a chat with the guys at L Acoustics who encouraged me and they said, you, you know, you could reprogram your set for um, spatial audio. And at that point, I had no idea what that was. And I was like, well, I don't know the software. I don't really understand it. Um, and they went, no, just come into the studio and we'll, we'll kind of help, help you get started. So they have a studio up in Highgate, uh, again, not, not far from here. Um, and at that point, you had to be within a ring of speakers in order to, to be able to hear 
the sounds that you were programming and where those sounds uh, are coming from. Latterly, all of the systems now have what's called binaural monitoring so that you can effectively listen to and, and get an approximation of, of the sounds you're, you're programming. So, you know, it was a bit of a, a tall order, but with the help of their engineers, you know, quite quickly, like any software, you kind of go through a bit of a learning curve, but it, 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 it's reasonably accessible. And I think one of my messages to you today is if, if it's something that interests you and you, you're not in, uh, getting involved in, in spatial audio yet, it's, it's kind of more accessible. There's, there's loads of tutorials these days online as well, if you want to have a go. So within a couple of days, I, I, uh, we'd, we'd reprogrammed the, the set. And I don't know if it was uh, particularly great use of spatial audio, but it, it was a kind of uh, have a go tech, tech hackathon anyway. So to me, it was just a real eye opener. It's like, gosh, you know, there's this other dimension of sound that I could use. If I want to, I can sort of spin sounds around or I can make sounds come from different areas of the audience. For me, that was interesting because my work varies from, while some of the stuff I do is beat driven, which might, I might place in a very traditional way where the kick and the bass is, is centered and monoed at the front of the auditorium. Some of the stuff I do is quite soundscapey and it's quite unusual. It's maybe off, off the sort of typical grid, as it were. So it's quite nice to be able to fire sounds in different places. Sometimes I'm verging into doing installations, in which case there's no front of the, uh, the auditorium. So it's starting to sort of break, break open that, um, that image of, of just being a sort of uh, uh, stereo front, uh, frontal image, as it were, and, and approaching sound in a slightly more 360 way. So for me, it was really fascinating. Um, uh, it, it was a really enjoyable show, and we were excited about doing it, but this was at the end of 2019, and then 2020, we went into lockdown. So we had to kind of put that dream a little bit on hold for, for the moment. And then the, the following year, I probably spent more time uh, working, for instance, because we only had the ability to do um, streaming, we worked on, on on our mixed reality. So we started working with Unity, a little bit with um, Unreal Engine in order to create enticing videos. So uh, I think it's interesting that the lockdown almost sort of pushes you to learn, uh, pushes us to, to learn those new skills. So lockdown kind of uh, lifts and we've got all of this visual material we've been working on. Um, in the meantime, I've learned sort of some rudimentary programming of lights also. I was very lucky to receive an Arts Council grant to put on an immersive show. So uh, I dry hired um, a place called the Copeland Gallery, which is down in, in Peckham, and effectively hired in um, a 12.1 L acoustics system. So you can kind of see what we've got here is 12, I think these are X8 speakers, uh, which were placed almost pretty much sort of democratically all, all around the room. So at the very beginning, when I'm playing just abstract soundscapes, the sound could just be coming from anywhere. And during that time, I'm also trying to make the sound and the lights kind of match up so that you start to get, as I sort of pointed with, with the installation artists earlier, you start to get the illusion that things are kind of joined up in, in space. So this was, this was a great opportunity to, to test this, this experience. And it's very difficult. So the, the feedback was really good from, from the show. Everyone sort of found it kind of interesting. One thing that I found over the, the, the sort of few years I've been doing this is it's very difficult for people to describe why they like immersive sound. People go, why, why is it good? It's like you just, you either had a good experience or, or you didn't, or you, you often don't get the chance to compare it to a stereo experience. It's really easy for people to describe, I love the LED um, screen or I, I loved um, the projections and the visuals. Those, those are things you can easily point to. But sound is a really difficult thing for people to, to ex explain why it, it might be interesting. Generally, if people, some people who've maybe got a little bit more experience with sound might say something like, there was great sound separation in the room. So you, rather than sort of muddying sort of a lot of tracks together into a stereo system, you can kind of split out. So you might have some drone synths kind of moving uh, around the audience. You've got your bass and your kick maybe nicely centered or or not, or you can, you can play with that. You can even duplicate sounds. Um, I mean, you can do this in stereo also, but you can duplicate sounds into different areas if you think there's not good enough coverage in different areas, um, different parts of the room. So there's lots of, lots of things you, you can do. I think even the visual aspect as people came into that room was sort of an excitement that the whole thing was planned around them as an audience. It's not sort of like, here's the artist over here. It's sort of like, this is an immersive experience. It's, it's for you, it's, it's, it's for everyone in the room. So this was a, a, a good experience and it encouraged me that it was a, a good um, avenue to, to pursue. So just to flip forward a year, this almost is a demonstration 
taking that where I'm working in Elisa, which is, the, as mentioned, the Elacoustics Propriety s software, and there I'm hiring in, luckily with funding, um, a, lo a load of speakers. And to be clear, like to, to hire that stuff in, and we did sort of two days and daytime installations, is probably about four or five grand. So it's it's expensive um, in comparison to hiring in you know, in ordinary PA systems. So the easy uh, solution for spatial audio is that you're finding a venue that's already got a spatial audio solution fit. So literally Hackney Earth, I think, is one of the only um, venues in London at the moment, probably the biggest venue in London that's actually got a bespoke spatial system. You've got some some of the um, art galleries, like, for instance, Lightroom in Tile Yard, if you visited that, is fit out with what's called a holoplot system. Um, but this is probably the, the biggest commercial um, spatial system in, in London. So this was kind of, a, kind of a great kind of movement from trialing to playing live. What I'm going to do is just show you a little bit of video just so you get a feel for what the show was like. Within the video, you can also see a little bit of how the lights also are. Ar we arrayed the lights around the room almost to match the positions of the speakers. What tends to happen in, as I do, immersive live sets is, is it, it try to almost it starts to leak off the stage and the show starts to come to the audience. And I think it's something that I kind of the reason is that sometimes I evangelise about this to to people is because I see from what I see like um, is there's a lot of immersive experiences popping up everywhere at the moment so you know every every few days there seems to be like a new venue in London that's doing an immersive experience but people are changing the way in which they ingest events and some, sometimes and how they want um, events to be delivered to them so and I also see you know there's a lot of the raves that have got the enormous LED screens with sort of massive uh, visuals it's almost as if the standards of what people are, are looking for from both the visual and um, uh, and sound to, together are, are raising. So spatial sound seems it can seem quite uh, niche at the moment because again, as I say, you know, there's only one massive venue with spatial sound fitted already in London. But there's more and more popping up. And even uh, I have a friend who runs like it's a coffee shop with a with a um, venue at the back of it in Bristol, which is just like a 200 cap venue. But uh, D&B have uh, pretty much loaned her uh, a system and D&B and, uh, and um, are, are putting their systems and spatial systems into more and more environments. There's, there's another venue called King's Place, which is just by King's Cross. Uh, they have a lot of artists passing through, but that's got um, now a semi-permanent D&B um, spatial system. And, and most of the artists being programmed are sometimes being programmed because they're, in, they, they're ready to, and open to use um, the spatial programming. And things like in recorded music, you probably see more and more artists are releasing in, in Atmos uh, mixers, partly slightly cynically in order to get placements through Apple Spatial. But also um, it's because more and more of uh, the devices we use every day are beginning to be spatial, uh, spatially equipped. So the last two generations of AirPods are actually theoretically spatial that would in, in, interpret um, spatial signals. Uh, if you go to, to uh, uh, Dolby in, in Soho, they'll take you out to the car because there's more and more high-end cars that are being fitted with spatial audio. Um, a lot of mix engineers I know are redoing their rooms and getting them certified by Atmos because the standard that everyone will want, I think, in the future will be what's the maximum standard we need this piece of music produced to and it will probably be in spatial audio of, of, of some description. So it, I think it's an important thing. It, you know, it doesn't mean that we, we can't make, make things in stereo or mono or play out. You know, I, I play out plenty of gigs in, in stereo. But the sort of standard of where things will be mixed in the future, I think, I think will be um, sp spatial audio. So just to come back to that event. So I'm uh, over there on stage. Before the event in the run up, I will have pre-programmed this file. But effectively, what we're looking at here is a bird's eye view of the auditorium 
And all of these dots on here represent what we call sound objects. So a sound object is a single mono or audio source. Uh, and they are receiving by Ethernet cable from my Ableton set. The automation is going in real time over to the file, which I've pre-programmed, and that's going out to their, to, to, to their system. So that's where they have like an ELISA processor on site effectively. Just to step back, just a sort of brief uh, technical, not very technical, run through of what is spatial audio. So I've talked about the sound objects and mono objects. So, you know, a mono sound source is just a, a single sound source that you would receive in mono. Stereo is actually a kind of a form of spatial. If you imagine that if you've got a left and right speaker, if you panned your mono object from left to right, what's happening is you know, one, one speaker is turning down and the other speaker is turning up. But your impression is that there is an object moving from left to right. So it's, it's a weird thing that your mind just automatically tries to think that uh, an, an audio object is a real thing in, in real space, whereas, uh, of course, that's not what's actually happening to the speakers. Surround sound um, was a form of, of spatial, like people were sort of uh, producing for sort of 5.1 and 7.1 systems. But that sort of slightly for, from old school in the sense that you would program for a specific output. You would program for 5.1 or, or 7.1. The philosophical shift when we get to spatial audio or immersive audio is that we go into what's called object-based mixing. So as mentioned, if we consider that an object is a single mono sound source, what happens when I'm object mixing is that I'm saying, OK, I want this object to appear as if it's over here versus the, the audience, for instance. So what happens is in the spatial software, whatever the speaker layout is, and it could change, it could change what the speaker layout is, the processor and, uh, and controllers will have to calculate what is the right speaker signal to give the audience in the middle to give them the impression that the object is there? So if there's four speakers around it, is it, is it an equal part of sound for, for, for each part of that? If there was a speaker right behind it, it's like, well, it's just coming out of that speaker. So it, it's, what, I would say it's agnostic of the speaker system. The point is, is that you as the producer are saying, I want the object to, there, to be there, and then I want the object to move across in space. It's not like with... Um, Stereo, where you might you might sort of say, okay, so that well, it's sort of like you're, you're panning stuff, but literally the engine is working out how to give people the impression that that's the case. There are several different softwares. So again, you know, Atmos is hugely de uh, dominant in the recorded uh, in industry. So this is a, a, a screenshot of the the Atmos um, renderer. This is a screenshot of Elisa, and this is. Um, I don't know if it's free, but very low cost, but it's envelope um, for Ableton. So it, it is easy to, to access these tools. I think all of them have trial periods if you want to try them out. Interestingly, a lot of them work in similar sorts of ways. So I've had a little bit of time, a little bit of a go mixing with, with Dolby, a little bit of uh, a go with, with envelope. They all work on, on similar principles. One of the key differences is that, uh, for instance, Elisa and envelope work on a hemispherical basis of coordinates as to where your stuff is in space if you start to elevate it. And Dolby work on a cube, which means you can't easily, at the moment, translate from one software to another. So as you mentioned, what's an audio object? It's a mono audio channel. Within the software, um, what you can program is some positioning metadata. So you can give it azimuth or pan. So effectively, that's saying if I'm standing in the middle of speakers, I can take my object and I can pan it anywhere. You know, that the speakers are uh, 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 I can pan it anywhere in the room and the engine will do its best to sort of replicate where I think that um, mono object is. Elevation, so if you've got overheads, as I say, within Elisa, it's worked out a little bit like it's a hemisphere, so I can push the object uh, upwards in space. Distance is something um, that doesn't exist in all the engines. So, for instance, in Elisa by L Acoustics, you have what's called a room engine. And what that does is, as you push the object uh, away, you can actually turn on a reverb. So as it gets further and further away, you can apply a specific reverb and you can make that reverb, you know, as with most reverbs, you can make it what you want, like a sound like a cathedral, etc. So it effectively turns the sound down and it can apply a reverb as well. Width is the final thing. So these two little dots here, so if you imagine each one of these is a mono object, 
the little lines at the side indicate width. So you can actually say, how many speakers do I want um, my object to be spread, spread across? So it might be that, for instance, for a kick or some percussion or a snare or something, you want it to be very sharp and you want it to be targeted into particular speakers. But it might be for a sort of warm pad or something, you might want that spread over a, a number of different speakers. So it's in, inside the engine in the software, it, it will also try and calculate, calculate out things like phasing issues, etc. But yeah, you can effectively spread sounds uh, around. Um, so yes, this is my uh, diagram that just explains that when you're looking at these overhead things, you're effectively looking at a sort of a a weird contact lens, but you're effectively looking at um, data. So just to recap, so for stereo mix, you are mixing for two channels, you are mixing for left and right. But in an object based mix, what's happening is you're giving your controller a load of, uh, first of all, you're telling it what the speaker data is, saying where are the speakers in the room, then you're saying where, where do I think I want the objects to sound like they're coming from. And then that's communicating with the processor, which is rendering what, it, what, what the calculation is of, well, OK, this is the speaker placement you're looking for. And then it's outputting it to however many speakers you've told it there are to, to play with. So effectively, what we've got here is um, a single track, which has been split into 17 different audio objects. And what happens here is, that on each of these tracks, you have a plugin. So this is um, the Elisa plugin, which communicates with the controller. So here, as mentioned, is the your overview of the auditorium. Um, each of these gray stripes is representative of a speaker. So um, and then each of these dots, which are numbered, is representative of, of an individual audio sound source. And within the software, I've already told it what each of the sound sources are and how they correspond to the sounds that I'm sending it, sending from, uh, from Ableton. And then that's also communicating with this part, which is, this is just an onboard processor, so you can work from home. Uh, if you're in a larger setup with more than 16 speakers, you would probably need a hardware processor. Okay, you should be able to see, sorry that we don't have a good audio output, that some of these dots are moving around. So basically what's happening is they're receiving uh, instructions from all the automation that is programmed into the clips. And then you can see that basically these are like two, the 13 and 14, which are moving around here, for instance, are actually the left and right. So basically two mono sources that link up to make one stereo synth noise that's moving around the auditorium. So yeah, so it just basically gives gives you um, a, a little bit of an idea of uh, how, how those objects work together. The ideal situation, as you said, is working with Earth. You've got an inbuilt Elisa um, L acoustic system um, and Elisa trained engineers who, who are supporting you. But what happens if you go to a place where they have a different system? So that kind of was one of the first things that came up for me. It's like I was just desperate to find spatial systems. So there was one, for instance, that's based at um, a place called Eclectic, which is uh, near Waterloo in London. And then there was also this opportunity to play in Milan, at, um, which had a sort of 7.1 uh, system, but I'd done all the programming already in uh, Elisa, and as mentioned at the moment, there's no easy way to translate from this to say um, Soundscape for DMB, or even for the Max for Live that they were using at Eclectic. But you can hack it, so you can use something called a Dante Virtual Sound Card, which effectively will matrix um, all of your speaker outputs that um, you're that you can, uh, as you saw, they're coming out with the processor there, and then you can matrix it into whatever speaker system in a venue. It's not in the interest of any of the manufacturers to say that their stuff works with uh, another manufacturer's hardware, but it can it can be done. So that was uh, Milan in uh, in the Elisa software. Another big thing to mention with respect of Im immersive sound and immersive opportunities. As mentioned, there's all these new places that are springing up that are interested in 360 experiences and offering 360 experiences to, to people. So on one hand, you know, um, venues. So this is a venue called the Old Market in Brighton. And I've played there um, before in 2022 from a stereo perspective. So just ordinary kind of left and right where I'm on the stage. And then they receive funding because they see the future as actually how do we translate ourselves into an immersive venue. So they received some funding to, to put on an event with a number of artists and I was one of the people that worked with them. They hired in these massive, huge sort of um, mesh 
um, screens and actually had those on all four walls. So they created what was traditionally the audience space for the old market. Uh, and it actually became almost like a white cube. So more like going to a gallery or something like that. But we then put loads of bean bags down and I changed the projections so that they worked on all all four sides. We also brought in an L acoustics sound system of 12 speakers. So you, you can just about see there's, there's three speakers just sitting at the top of each of these screens. And this was really interesting again, because for the first time I could also say, okay, if the sound starts over here, maybe I can start the visual over there. And those two things are going to match up. And then it can look as if something literally starts there and then envelops and goes around the audience. And while there's lots of work to be done with that, I really feel like I just sort of scratched the surface. It seemed, it seemed really interesting. And uh, it's interesting, I went to a venue called W1, so Flannels on Oxford Street, if anyone's been there. If you go downstairs, there's 360 LED screens there, and it's all just perfectly set up for, for this kind of, kind of activity. Um, and that's a consumer um, you know, space. Um, so I think, um, I think these are on the rise. This is another um, exhibition that we did. At, this is at Outernet. So if you come up Tottenham Court Road and you see immediately, there's, these are like the biggest LED screens in, in, in Europe. Um, and I was lucky to be invited into a project that was uh, being done with a visual artist called Jack Dartford. Um, and this was, uh, it, it was kind of for, for um, Mental Health Awareness Week. Um, but they had sort of 70 odd L acoustic speakers and they weren't actually using them for spatial audio. So it was really interesting is that um, this is designed or that space is designed, it's for brands to kind of do experiential work. So the interesting thing is who can afford to bring about large spatial um, systems? Well, big brands can and actually brands are really interested in experiences. And so again, I think if for people, if we're looking um, for career opportunities in the future, you know, brands are interested in, in people who are capable of creating um, spatial sound. Uh, so yeah, that's just a little bit about how those speakers in the Eliza software. Um, and then finally, this was uh, another experience. This is a metaverse concert. So I work with a company called Condensed Reality based in Bristol, who are trialing with artists all the time. And they're building like this sort of, um, they call it the blueprint. So it's like a venue that they can reskin every week for a different artist. And this is really interesting. We actually used Eliza Sound to do a binaural um, output live. Uh, and this is how the gig looked. Uh, people joined as avatars. I was mapped uh, in real time and projected onto this podium. So it was a real time gig that was out in binaural audio, which is exciting. And if you imagine like the next step of this will be headsets. So again, headsets and VR is an area where people, it's still kind of on the tipping point of, is this going to be everywhere? And I do think that that's going to be something that's going to be knit into um, our lives in a very big way. And of course, with headsets, you can do stuff where you're actually matching, you know, sounds can be fixed in space, for instance. I mean, that's, that's already kind of happening. But, you know, will, will gigs and electronic music also be m more prevalent in virtual space? So yeah, so that's just to give uh, an insight into if people are interested, how my Ableton sets look. So effectively, uh, I'm running each track as a broken out number of uh, audio uh, objects. I also trigger the visuals. So hiding inside this group is just like a little hack with some OSC code which is triggering visuals which are on a different PC. So I try and keep the PC, I try and keep my visuals separate from my sound so that you know one doesn't overload the other because I'm also usually running spatial audio um, software on my main MacBook also. You can also run lighting out of Ableton. So the interesting thing is if you're interested to learn that, I'd say, you know, buy, buy a couple of lights and um, there's a piece of uh, software called EMU by Entech, uh, similar to the Eliza plugin. You can place it on a track and you can actually program DMX uh, in a very similar way um, to the, you, that you would uh, program um, spatial sound. 
So all the lighting is running, and I usually use wireless kit, which is sort of ranged around uh, the room. And then on top of that, I have live tracks so that I can just kind of um, use my, I usually use a push. So I, I'll just sort of call up the instruments as I go through different tracks, find something so there's still an element of performance. I think one thing to, to think about, particularly if you're doing immersive performance, is, is a lot of planning work at the moment to do it. I would love to also be, I've seen lots of performers do things like hack Game Boys and uh, run their spatial live and they're actually doing their live, maybe on iPads or whatever, placing stuff around the room. At the moment, there's so much going on that I've just kind of pre-programmed pretty much everything. But there's so, there's so much more here to, to explore and so many different ways of using immersive technologies, let's say, in order to create interesting experiences. Um, so yeah, just to summarize, for me, the opportunities is really f um, flexible sound control for me because as I say I do stuff that's more like an installation, but I also then can draw that back into a more traditional frontal image if I choose. Really excellent sound coverage, and I feel from everything I've, I've experienced, there's a heightened audience experience. It, the program is more accessible than, than, you, than you think. I think it's like anything, like even when you first approach uh, a door like Ableton or Logic, it can be very confusing, but there's lots of tutorials and support online. Many more venues are investing in spatial sound systems. And the interesting thing is, as they invest in sound systems, it becomes a vacuum of content. So they're desperate to have people. It's like if you do spatial audio, they're going to invite you because, um, because they need people to show off the, the sound system they've invested in. So that was a good reason I played at Amsterdam Dance Event, because uh, a club called The Other Side decided to have a point of difference, uh, even though they do club music generally, and they put in a 14.1.5 um, system just recently. So uh, I was invited over via Red Acoustics to be the first artist to perform uh, at ADE, which was just a brilliant, brilliant experience for me. And extensions to installations and virtual reality, I really think those are, they're just growing. They're just growing in, in number all the time. Challenges are, you know, in-house systems aren't that prevalent and it's expensive to hire. So for me, for instance, I always have to think, I need to be able to do this in stereo as well as in spatial. There's a programming requirement uh, and you do need to have, uh, you, you know, artist tools are being created. Sometimes it is really fiddly and I just think, I just want to write in the air that it goes like this. Um, but, you know, you have to draw in stuff in Ableton could sometimes be a little bit um, fiddly. There's, there's a lot of increased setup and planning, but it, it can really pay off. And then communication across formats, as I say, is not there. Interoperability is not something that is in the manufacturer's interest to really pursue massively. But I think it will get there in the end. So, um, so yeah, so yeah. So thanks, <laughs> thanks very much. Uh, thanks for listening. And um, just, uh, I, I don't know if there's any questions. When it comes to your live performances, are your, is your automation you stick that more towards where the sounds are or the patterns of the music or the, the, the chord structures or melodies and harmonies or when you're doing a live show are you combining the two or you, you, your controller you controlling where things are yourself or you're just letting the automation do it or are you at the moment I'm generally letting the automation do it so so yeah and people have built and I know there's companies like Intorno Labs in, in, in Italy that have built some really nice interesting intuitive tools so it'd be great to get into that and I know for instance like you're probably aware Max Cooper is another um, artist that uses a lot of spatial so works with that acoustics DMB etc but he um, has almost worked with another engineer at uh, the show they did um, in Brixton recently um, so they would actually be kind of intuitively throwing stuff around the room. So yeah, it's definitely something that I'd like to explore, but at the moment it's just all automated, yeah. The spatial audio sounds like it's very expensive to get into and you need dedicated venues already there that know about you and, and are able to bring you in so you can use their systems. Um, is the lighting side any easier to sort of DIY? Um, I feel you mentioned um, using uh, Ableton to wirelessly send signals to yeah. various lights. So can you talk about that shortly? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, so basically I got into it because um, another, some guys I was doing a remix for called New Opera Hero um, were huge advocates of DIYing and then they used to do shows at like Covent Garden or whatever. It, they're really incredible. And they just said, they said, buy this software <laughs> by Entech and they, lent, they kindly lent me a couple of lights. Um, so what happens with lights is they work on the, sorry, uh, um, it's called, um, so it was called DMXis, but that's now defunct. So the replacement is called EMU, like EMU, 
Um, and the company is called Entech with two T's. There's two Entechs. But um, yeah. So um, effectively, lights work. Each light that you have often has a series of DMX addresses. Um, and each of those DMX numbers um, tells the light to do something different. So one, one, you know, channel one might be tilt, another one might be sort of spin, another one will be strobe, another one might be, you know, all the different colours so you can colour mix uh, those lights. So um, as long as you just get, and it's really exciting once you get hold of a, one of the, the lights that maybe does those things because it's sort of like, oh, I'm controlling, <laughs> like a little robot. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously if you've got a number of those, it's something whereby realistically, I'm not a very good lighting designer. And I, I, I haven't got the, the time and the expertise to be a great lighting designer that can control multiple universes of lights in a venue. But what's interesting is if I just bring one bespoke package at least, because you you program it against the audio in Ableton. It's precisely what you imagine in time with the music, whereas a lighting engineer, they can be great, but they're just sort of guessing and they've got some set things that they do that look good. So even though your stuff might be awkward, it's unique and people respond to that quite quickly. And it's weird how we don't notice how much we actually absorb. Like when you go to a DJ show and it's just got, you know, someone's got just like a strip of lights that are just going on, well, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Kind of it's like it's nice, but you know it's not like a wow factor. So if you get your own lights and you can learn, you know, have fun doing that, then you can you can sort of, you know, you may not be doing a, an Aphex Twin laser light show, but, you know, you can produce an effect in people because you can go right at that point which goes bang, all the lights are going to come on, come off. And then people sort of like, oh, what happened? I, I, would, I would say just on your other point about it, it sounds really complicated. <laughs> Hopefully I haven't. <laughs> it sounds complicated. I think I'm trying to be honest about some of the challenges. You know, it's not something you walk into a club tomorrow and go, oh, I want to spatialize this this track but I think it's worth the effort right now because it's sort of on the way uh, I think there's just going to be so many more opportunities in immersive music and I think you know music is so it's such a suffused and competitive area it's good to have uh, niche skills etc or other things you know it doesn't have to be that but you know it, it's good to to explore if that's something that interests you um, and once you're in it, you know, you find I'm talking about I, I've done this with quite high end companies like L Acoustics sort of by accident. That's how I've got into it. But actually, Nick, who runs the Crux AV events, I've seen him do spatial stuff with just like a and, you know, he's just clever. And I was just bun <laughs> he, he, he knows how to wire them up. You, you, I think you could just wire them up with sort of um, um, with envelope as a as a fairly free tool uh, and uh, probably a multi output sound card, something like that. So it, it's um, so sorry if I've made it sound more complicated than 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 it probably can be. Um, my question is, well, I'm I currently like partly work for this um, AV sort of installation guy, and this next project, he actually partnered with L Acoustics for his next project. Oh, and I begin the compositional phase next week. So I just wanted to see if you could talk any through th your thought process of when using L Acoustics, what you sort of think about in the sort of compositional thought process. First of all, it is good to know what your end speaker points will be, whether it's one venue with a particular or is it a speaker setup that might move around into different um, arenas or is it one fixed location, one fixed location. So it, it isn't a bad idea to know what that speaker, What first of all, you know, do you have overheads, for instance, or is it all just, is it is it in the round? Is the audience within within the circle or is it more... Um, because as you, if it's a reasonably large venue, there's, there's some things you can't get away with. So for instance, like with, with Hackney Earth, the, the stacks at the front are much more powerful than the ones at the, the side. So if you need a sound to be heard, it still has to come out of the front, the front array. You can certainly play with lots of other sort of synth and incidental sounds and vox, vox etc. But so you need to understand what the relative power of the different speakers are and what their layout is and what the relationship of that is. Um, to the audience, so yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess there's a whole a whole number of things that could unfold from that. It sounds really exciting, particularly if if it is in the round and the then and because oh, the other thing that you can do within Eliza is you can actually stick a um, tracker on a dancer or on a so so sometimes they use it for huge arena gigs. So if you imagine 
um, Adele is doing a residency at Las Vegas at the moment, and that's an Elisa immersive system. As she walks from left to right, there's a very slight movement of, of, of her from, from, from left to right. With dancers, you can actually stick a tracker on them so that the sound will follow them. So it may be that that's of, of interest. That's a creative way um, to, to, use that, uh, to use that. I think the interesting thing about spatial is that it's about how does it translate to the audience? How does it change their experience? So just thinking about the practicalities of that, of what their sightline, of what the dancer is, where the sound is. And ideally, you know, if you can meld things together or you could play with not melding them together, you know, it's what the interplay of those factors might be. My question is always related about the music composition. So do you take inspiration by the sounds of nature when you create your live set for electronic music performances? Interesting, not nature per se, but I do um, tend to talk about things that are being organic and inorganic. And I think I kind of like the idea. So for instance, I'll use um, not necessarily my own Foley recordings, but taking from Foley albums. Um, so a, a lot of the percussive sounds I use are layers and layers of, you know, tiny bits of, you know, a, a breaking bottle or something like that. So I tend to weave organic sounds, but I kind of like organic things redone in an inorganic or unusual way. It kind of makes it a bit more surreal and, and quite possibly that's why I like spatial sound as well. It's sort of like, it's, it's, it's kind of like playing with what's real, I suppose. So, yeah. My question is, I guess if you could sort of give students advice about the one positive thing you've done after leaving Point Blank that helped um, positively impacted your career trajectory. So once you left, what's yeah. one great thing that you did that it's, helped your career? It's interesting when I think where it started was I did my diploma here and part of the diploma music production was to do a course on sync music. And I'd previously kind of worked in marketing and advertising stuff. So I was like, oh, I can do that. It's like a brief and then I get the brief and then I know how to do that. And so I immediately went and I Googled every sync agent in uh, London and I wrote to all of them and um, like none of them responded apart from one person. Um, and that was um, a company called Felt, a lovely guy called Steve who brought me in. And I done, I, that's it, I did an EP. I did an EP on Point Blank Records while I was here. And he was like, can you make me 15 more tracks like that? And I think I got as far as 13. Um, but anyway, he published that album and then they actually signed me to their record label. It wasn't necessarily that it was that thing because that was the start of a journey. And, you know, I released an album with him and it sort of went <laughs> like that. Um, you know, it didn't really necessarily go very far. It took years for me to kind of find who I was, I think, um, from a music point of view. And I tried everything, lots and lots of different sort of um, things. But I just say the, the biggest thing is it just gives you not just do something. <laughs> you just put your foot on the road somewhere and eventually you'll kind of sort yourself into the thing that you, you like, you know, just ge generate opportunities. My thing with Point Blank is I've always said I've a huge gratitude to, to this organisation, a huge gratitude to all the people in it and all the techs, you know, many, many of you, are in, some of them no longer no longer here, but I think while you're here, um, take every opportunity because it's not it's not just about what you learn in the lessons. It's like I volunteered to uh, mic up an orchestra for someone called Justin Lindley, who's the teacher. I've volunteered with Phil Ramekin uh, to be at his studio. I recorded the people on the vocalist course. Um, I did some interning through Point Bank at Vortex Jazz Club where I did Front of House, which is completely different to the stuff I, I did. But it's just like the, the tutors here are all got so much information inside them. You know, there's so many people here, but your peers as well, your, your, you know, so many people who know so much. Um, so just just try and get involved with as much as possible so you can find out who you are, I suppose. That's that's what I'd say. How would you practice uh let's say experimenting with immersive or surround audio if you don't have let's say the equipment it's a really good question and and um so i say the the great thing that happened since 2021 f for me with elisa but i think it was also maybe the same time for dolby atmos is that you've got binaural monitoring so i don't know if everyone's familiar with what binaural does but binaural kind of kind of mimics uh, your ears like the pinna of your ears so as sounds move backwards it sort of slightly muffles them to give the impression that that it's it's behind you it's not perfect by by any means but it's at least a way of um of being able to sort of test where your sounds sounds are in space i think probably uh, again i am kind of lucky because 
and acoustics have been very kind that if, that if I if I am presenting in spatial audio at a festival or a venue, they will allow me to go and use their um, showroom, which is based like it's just half an hour away from me. But the truth is, that what I really would like right like now, um, and I've been applying for funding, is is to build my own little spatial spatial setup. Um, so and I need to sort of figure out how to do that um, in in my head as well. So yeah, it, it's a little bit more. It's probably a bit more challenging, but you know, I think particularly like in a school like this, there'll be people who who will know how to do that and how to get you set up. I had exactly the same question, oh, really? but uh, I also wanted to ask what is because you're working with this great setup in your studio. I was curious to know what is the main difference you noticed when you go on the big stage, in terms of how the audience perceive the music. Well, it's made, like I so for instance also with Earth, I made sure that I did a full sound check a week before, and luckily because they're L acoustics related, that they allow me in, and I went with a representative from L acoustics. On a practical level, what was really good was I learned exactly what I was just talking about earlier, which is if you the relative power of speakers with the five more powerful ones at the front. I almost sort of didn't believe it when I was told to do it that way, but um, then I realised like if I I, my crucial sounds, even if I want the crucial sounds to also appear back here, some of those very crucial sounds also need to come out one of these five speakers because the, the relative power is, is so much greater than, than, than the other ones. So I think I learned something about, uh, you, you know, a little bit about the practicality of, of, of different speaker layouts um, from, from that. The thing is, stereo is the same. You can go into a club and, you know, one club sounds one way and another club sounds in a, a, a completely different way. And it sounds completely different from your monitoring environment. Um, so to a degree, wherever possible, I try and, um, you know, I always do early setups if I possibly can to have a little time. And then I'll actually go and adjust it or I'll talk to the engineer um, as, to, as to how I can, can adjust it. But I think the other thing, you know, if you're just talking about spatial in live, sounds can get more indistinct. So when monitoring, everything is pinpoint perfect. But as I say, I think in stereo, it's the same thing. Things can be kind of like, it, it can be not as perfect. But the comments that I get from spatial gigs are best, best sound separation people have heard. And I don't know whether they're just imagining that because they know it's in spatial. But generally speaking, it's, it's been a positive reaction. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for, for having me here. Thank you.